Yeah, first Sunday back from sabbatical. I've been gone. My name is Charlie. For those of you that I've not met yet, it's nice to have you here. I'd love to shake your hand and greet you and uh, let you know a little bit about our church. And um, today, I'm just, I'm excited. I, I'm the lead pastor, and I've been, uh, as you heard, been on sabbatical for some rest and reflection for about uh, four months um, and, and some time of healing. You know when you break your arm, anybody break their arm? Anybody break a leg, an arm? They say, what, eight weeks or something? You got to put it in a cast. I saw Amy's got a carpal tunnel surgery and she's got something wrapped all up. And, you know, you can, uh, someone said time heals everything. You heard that? Time heals everything. That's not true. That's, that's a bunch of baloney. Time does not heal everything. Uh, if you put your arm in a cast and let it be immobile for eight weeks, it will heal. But if you don't put your arm in a cast and you just keep trying to use it, you know, it may heal, but it's going to be, you know, I don't know how, it's, they'll have to re-break it. You know, that's not healing if it's not in the right spot where it was designed by God for it to be. Or you just keep using it and just never, you know, quite gets the thing and it's just this floppy deal over there. Uh, time doesn't heal everything. Uh, some of you have been hurting. And uh, you've been going through this like, God, when am I going to be healed? When am I going to, this, this break in my heart, maybe you've gone through an emotional time, a breakup, something where your heart emotionally has had a loss of loved one, and it's gone. And you're going, God, when is this ever going, this ache ever going to stop? When it, how come, God, it's been a long time? Um, Sandy and I have been married this year for 40 years. Yeah, I know, I know, it's amazing. And, uh, and we're getting to go on an anniversary trip in six weeks, and I know I've been gone for four months, but we're going for two weeks and on an anniversary trip. This was planned before the whole thing. But uh, the, the time, 40 years, has not made a great marriage. That is not what has given us a great marriage. We've been married 40 years, but we could be together and have a pretty cruddy marriage or a pathetic marriage or a mediocre marriage. But it's been great because we intentionally spend time together. And here's what heals. Intentional time with God heals. Intentional time, and I put listening underline. If you're taking notes, if you haven't pulled it out yet, and you're just kind of looking at me like, yeah, he's just going to pop off. Who is this guy? I am going to pop off, and I'm this guy. So you ought to, yeah, you maybe just, I'll take some notes and see, see if there's maybe something here for me today. Intentional time listening to God heals. When the doctor says, keep your arm in a cast, if you're intentional about it, you keep it in a cast, you'll come out and go, oh, look, eight weeks, I'm better. Oh, I've been doing this a long time. But I haven't necessarily been listening to God, and so the pain is still there, the hurt is still there, the problem is still there. I have a physical therapist. I, I met, I met uh, John and his wife. They, you're gone. Oh, you are moved. They're brand new to the church, like four or five weeks. I don't know. They don't even know me, but they're going, like, who is this guy? Now he's calling me out. She's a physical therapist. So I got a good buddy who's a physical therapist, and I jacked up my shoulder a, a while back doing this thing called CrossFit. Don't try it. It's awful. I don't recommend it to anybody. Uh, and I jacked my shoulder. I'm like, oh, man. And so I, I go see my buddy, and he goes, hey, do this. And he gives me these rubber bands, and he goes, do this, right? He goes, like, just do this, like, you know, for the next eight weeks, do this. Like, what is, what is stupid? Rubber bands, that's not going to do anything. And my shoulder hurts anyway. And, and I, I come back to him, he goes, I don't, I don't think it's working. Well, have you been doing this? No. <laughs> I've known God for a long time. Almost 50 years. And, and I hate to admit, admit this, but some of the pain that I've experienced... Uh, In, in the last few years and how I intentionally stopped listening to God. I, I stopped doing what he asked me to do. But in the same time, I'm complaining to God. God, it still hurts. God, the pain is still there. God, why don't you do one of your miracle things? You know, just pour that pixie dust on there and let me be better because I believe your Bible says that you're a God who does miracles. You're a God who can do anything. So God, do that thing in me. Over the next few weeks, as I re-enter into my, my role here, I'm going to share with you some of the things that God has shown me in this time about listening to him, hearing him. Uh, but I have to say thank you first. I want to say thank you to you. 
Those of you who've been part of this place, you know me. Those of you who are brand new here, you came and checked us out. Thank you. It's an honor to be able to serve you and to be a church where we can help people experience this God of the universe who loves you. And I, I just appreciate you just What you afforded me as a pastor to take time away and to be healed and to intentionally stop and reflect upon who he is, it's the greatest gift you could give anybody. When you see the best in somebody, say, hey, you're not living your best and we need you at your best or you, we want you at your best because you're a child of God and we're going to help you experience that. That's love. Continually riding the alcoholic with booze because they really want it and they need it. That's not love. That's not the best for them. But when you take a step back and say, hey, we're going to help you get healed. You won't put your own you know, arm in a cast, so we're going we're to help you do that. And uh, you guys, oh, just fantastic, thank you. And, and don't we have the best team around? Yeah. Our, our pastoral team, yeah. <laughs> Rev Kev and uh, Pastor Kay, where's Kay at? She's, um, yay. Stephen, you married well, brother. Nice job, man, yeah. And thanks for letting her serve alongside of us. And, and uh, just, uh, when I was gone, we baptized, you saw the video, 35 people. Now I snuck in on that and watched. And I'm like, I'm looking, I'm going, I don't know some of these people who are getting baptized. All this happened while I was gone. This is amazing. Unbelievable. More people than we've ever baptized, I think, in the history of our church in 20 years. And, and I wasn't even here. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Man, you guys crushed it. Uh, I have to tell you, the first month of being gone, I was gone for four months, for those that don't know, the first month was awful. It was really hellish. I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, what do, what do I do? I, this is the, and, and so, you know, I don't know if you do this, but when you don't know what's going on with something that you, you really care about, um, you, you, you think about it a lot. There's another term for it the Bible uses. It's called worry. And I'm here stressing over this place. What, what's happened? Are anybody showing up? Uh, is, is anybody giving? Is, you know, what, is there any, any problems going on? And the church, God bless them, took away all my passwords, couldn't get into my email, couldn't get into nothing. I, and I'm being serious, nothing. They said, do not show up on this property. We will kick you off. Don't even drive by it. The whole, so I'm getting nothing. And I got this one buddy, I've known him 33 years, so a long time. You know, been in my home many times. Uh, he's just a great guy. Really, really appreciate him. Uh, in fact, he comes over to the house all the time because he brings my grandkids over. And, uh, and he would come over. Pastor Stephen, my son, who's one of the pastors on, on the team here, would come over and go, how's, how's church? And he'd look at me and go, Dad, you're on sabbatical. You're not supposed to talk about it. I know, I know, but hey, I changed your diapers. Come on. We, you, know, you, you know, come on, man. But, you know, and he's Dad, I know. And that putz, he just, he was so, he was lipped up. I could not get anything out of him. And uh, it was, it was rough. I, I, I think I got like four texts from, from people in church and they were like, oh man, Kevin's crushing it. You don't need to even come to, you don't even need to come back. <laughs> I, I did come back two weeks ago to hear Pastor uh, Becky speak and share and, um, it was really cool, and I'm walking through the, through the lobby out there. Some of you saw me, and it was just, you know, really nice. And um, I uh, moved from worrying about, you know, you know, what's happening to this place to, does this place even need me? Um, you know, am I still valuable? And, and, and what if they don't want me back? These are kind of the things, that first month going through my head. What if I'm not even wanted? And I'm walking the halls a couple Sundays ago, and I met a guy I didn't know, first, first time here, nice guy, and said, hi, I'm Charlie, and, uh, you know, nice to meet you. And, okay, so who, you are who? And he was really nice about it, but it was like, who? I'm Charlie, I'm, I'm, I'm the senior pastor of Church on the Ridge, you know? <laughs> he goes, oh, you're that guy. And again, the guy, was, the guy was wonderful. There's no issue. Um, but it hurt a bit. Uh, like, hey. And I began to think about many of you who have been around here a long time. Uh, some of you have been around here as long as, you know, helped to start the church 20 years ago. 
Uh, some of you have uh, been around a while. You were with us in the old building. And you sacrificed and you gave and you supported and you served. And man, you poured into it. And now we've been over here for a little while and maybe you're starting to feel a little bit like I felt. Like, am I even needed? Am I even wanted? A lot of new people. Maybe all the intentions going to the new people. All the loves going to the new people. And man, I, I've been here. And... Um, I want you to know, uh, you are not here to be forgotten. You're not forgotten, and you're not here to be forgotten. And I can't thank you enough. Those of you that have been here, and you've stood by this place, and you've helped it, and you've supported it, you've discipled your, your, ki your, your kids, have been raised here, you've served and volunteered. And I'll be reaching out to you over the next few months, and be talking about what God has for us in the future, because, uh, you know, my time here is starting to, starting to slow down a little bit. And, uh, and, and, but God's got good things for us. One of the things that we did, when Sandy and I moved here 21 years ago, we moved here in 2003, we started the church in 2004, but we, we began to pray. God, you know what? We began to intentionally pray, intentionally spend time with God. God, what do you want for us? What do we do? And as we began to look at the community, the community was not near as big as it is today, but we could look at the community, community and, and we saw little kids, medium kids, Big kids, everywhere, everywhere we went. There's kids, there's, oh, look, there's another one. Look, there's another one. They're running in the parks, running in the streets. Man, there's kids everywhere. And it was like God was saying, Charlie, uh, I heard the statement, whoever wins the kids wins. Whoever wins the kids, whoever wins the heart of your kids wins your family. You know it's true. People love people, love people who love their kids, right? When I whip out my phone and show you my grandkids, you better fawn over them. Oh, they're the cutest things in the world. Man, if you don't, you're, I'm right, you up, you're dead to me. Um, <laughs> no, people love people who love their kids. So whoever wins, the kids win. So we've got to do something. Oh, when we moved here, Stephen was 12 years old. My daughter Hannah was eight. My youngest was six, Caleb. And, uh, you know, we said, hey, we gotta, we're going to start this church. We're going to try to reach people. And Stephen says, Daddy, I'll help, I'll help. I was a children's pastor for many years. He goes, Daddy, I want to be a children's pastor. I want to work with students. And Okay, that's cool, but you're 12, right? Hannah goes, Daddy, 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 I want to help too. I want to work with preschool. I want to, I want to work in the nursery with the preschool kids. That's awesome that you're eight, you know? And, and Caleb was six, and, and he raised, Daddy, 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 I want to eat the donuts. <laughs> So we told him we were going to serve donuts at church. I said, this would be a great church. Having donuts, this is awesome. So my, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, it was really cool. So we needed, we needed someone to work with the kids. And we had heard that at Northwest University, they'd hired a brand new student ministries director. And uh, she was brand new. So I said, oh, you know what? I'm going to reach out to her and see if she's got any students that will come up here and, and intern maybe and work with our kids because we've got so many kids around this place. And, and so I made an appointment, sat in her office, and where he actually goes, well, we just moved here. Yeah, we came from uh, Minneapolis, and we're here, and, you know, it's a new place for us. And, you know, I don't know the students really all that well yet, but if we get to know them, you know. And so I'm, I'm just going, hey, you know what? You're new. We're new. Why don't you come over to our house for dinner? So they come over to dinner, her and her husband, Tony, and brought her two little kids, uh, Andrew and Katie. And uh, Katie was six years old, and Caleb was six years old, so that was kind of cute, you know. And they didn't like each other, but it was kind of cute. And... Uh, and so, you know, I, and I just put on the dog. I, I bought steaks, you know, that like this thick and just, you know, hey, and I'm just trying to be nice. You know, I want her to send students our way. And by the time that dinner was over, she says, you know what, Tony, I've been praying about it since we met. And we feel like we're supposed to come and be your children's pastors if you'll, if you'll have us. Like, you kidding me? We get the professor, not the intern? You know, nothing wrong with interns, but come on, you get the... And it was, you know, one of those answers to prayer when you intentionally spend time with the Lord, listening to his voice. It's amazing what takes place. I know it's my first Sunday back. Can I chase a rabbit? <laughs> okay, okay, it's the first thing. I, I, 27 years ago, Sandy and I began praying for our youngest son, Caleb. He came out, this is the kid that wants to eat the donuts, and he was just a little chunk, he's a little Buddha baby we call him, because he had rolls on top of rolls, and just the cutest little guy in the world. And, and we began to pray for his spouse. We began to pray for the person that would, he would one day commit to in marriage. God, bring him a person into his life that will walk alongside him, help him to follow you, let the two of them serve you together, whatever calling, whatever vocation they do, but God, let it be with you in the center of their heart, the center of their life, and we begin to pray over that for him. Now fast forward 21 years. 
We're taking this little boy that we've been praying for for 21 years off to college. And we fly across the country. I say we. Sandy actually flew him across country to Lakeland, Florida. I know some of you are here from Lakeland this morning. God bless you guys. Welcome. And, uh, or close to it. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're flying all the way out there. And she's walking. Oh, about, about seven years into the start of the church, Chris and Tony moved off. Moved, moved away. Moved back east. And, uh, and uh, we continued to contact them and the whole thing. But they weren't with us anymore. But gr growing up, Caleb and Katie hate each other. Just these kids and oh, two pastors' kids. Why do we always have to be together? Because we're always together, right? And, oh, what was it, Katie again? Oh, it's only one my age, but uh, she's a girl. Uh. <laughs> Flight to Lakeland, Florida, Southeastern University. Sandy's walking through the cafeteria and she sees Chris, our old children's pastor. Chris, what are you doing? So I just took a job. I'm now the dean of, of ministries for the, uh, the whole school. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, we just moved here. Well, Caleb's going to start school here. Oh, great. And he says, well, where's he going to serve? You know, if you come to school here, you've got to serve in the church. You've got to volunteer. And he goes, wow, we're not even going to give him a car. We don't trust him yet. But, uh, you know, uh, well, K Katie is serving at this church. She can give him a ride. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> Folks, you want to fall in love with someone? Serve in ministry together. Right. Volunteer in a church together. You'll, you'll find out that, hey, this person's values line up with my values. Hey, you know what? We're, we're moving in the same direction. We're serving the same God. You can find, you know, someone who's just all hot and you're just looking the best and, you know, but you won't make it 40 years. When you're out of alignment, it doesn't work. But her and him and Katie begin to see that, man, our hearts are for the same thing. And they started serving together, and then they got married. And today, we just, just moved them from where they'd served one of the largest churches in the, in the area to Tucson, Arizona. I've, I've been to Tucson once for less than 24 hours when I helped them unload the stinking truck, and it was 9,000 degrees outside. <laughs> okay, that's the end of that rabbit trail. Oh, here's, here's my point. There is, there is a point. Praying for the answer, intentionally spending time with God, not seen the answer for years and years. And some of you have been praying for your kids a long time. Or you've thought about praying for your kids a long time. Or you give up, gave up praying for your kids for a long time. Or your dream. Or something else. And I tell you, man, you talk to my wife and she'll tell you, you don't stop. You keep going. Good things happen when we intentionally spend time with the Lord. Proverbs 2 says it like this. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Listen to what I say. Treasure my commands. That's prayer. That's intentionally spending time with God. When you listen to him, you say, whoa, I want to hear. I, th this is a treasure to me. God downloaded this to me. This is, this is awesome. And then verse 9 goes on and says, then, then you will understand what is right and fair. And good things will happen to you. That's not the way the Bible says it. The Bible says that then you'll find the right way to go. Some of you right now, you're going, I don't know which way to go. I don't know which way to go in my marriage. I don't, I don't know if we're going to make it 40 years. I don't know if I'm going to make it in this job. This, I, don't, I don't know if I need to leave this job, stay in this job. Do I move out of the air? Do we sell? What do we do? I don't know what to do. And it says, hey, intentionally spend time with me and you will find the right way to go. And here's what God says. When you begin to spend time with me, you'll find out that he says, I am for you, not against you. That, that, I, that I would give you strength that you never knew you had. Nothing can stand against you when God is with you. When I begin to listen to God, intentionally spend time with him, and he directs me to do the things that he wants me to do instead of the things that I want to do for God. So much stuff I want to do for God, and it's more for me than it is for him. So I think it makes me look good. I think it makes me you know, feel better. Remember I told you I've been married 40 years? Um... We don't have a great marriage because we've been married 40 years. Because when we got married, I didn't know this about Sandy. She is an uber introvert. Some of you go, how come I can't get to know Sandy? She's an introvert. You want to get to know her, go serve with her. She serves in the nursery. She loves it. But you get to know her. She's an awesome lady. She's got to get past that, you know, her own introversion. I thought she was an extrovert. She's an, she's an introvert. So I'd drag her around to parties. Hey, let's go. We've got people coming over. I'd invite people who she wouldn't know about. Here's another thing I, I, I didn't know about her. She has lists for her lists. I've never seen a list. I, 
She, she does not do spontaneity. She plans. She's, she's like, this, this uh, vacation I'm telling you about, she's been planning this for years. Like, I know where, I, I know where I'm going to be on Tuesday, October 3rd. <laughs> because she's, and me, I, hey, let's go over there. Hey, let's go over there. Hey, let's chase it. She's, hey. That does not make for a conducive marriage. I learned that she doesn't appreciate gifts. I love gifts. Bring me gifts, folks. I love gifts. I love gifts. She doesn't like gifts. She, you, know what, you know what she loves? She loves uh, acts of service. Yes. Yes. <laughs> she'll put on, she, you know, she's in the nursery, she won't hear this, but she'll put on negligee if I'll wash the windows. <laughs> That's the sexiest thing I can do for her. Wash, cleaning the stove. <laughs> what? We are exact opposites. I can do all kinds of things for her that I thought were nice. Buy her gifts, you know, ridiculous stuff, you know, plan these spontaneous parties, have people come over. It's like, I don't even like you. Why do you keep doing this? I can look at her and go, what's wrong with you? Or I can say, I'm going to be intentional about my love for you. I'm going to do the things that you want instead of the things that I want. There's a phrase in the Bible that God kept reminding me of during my time away. It's better to obey than sacrifice. It's better to obey than sacrifice. And I didn't really like that because we, you know, we're constantly calling people to sacrifice. Man, give sacrificially, serve sacrificially, live sacrificially, all this stuff, be a sacrifice. In fact, even in that song we sang, Lord, it's not, oh, no, it's kind of good in the lyrics there. Thank you, Rachel and Abby for, for, Abby for singing those songs this morning. But hey, it's not a sacrifice because it's, you're, you're worth it all. And I went, oh, that's it. But we make it into this sacrifice, do, 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 do. And, and instead, obey, obey, obey. It's pictured beautifully in the life of Jesus. And here's the deal. Whenever we talk about the life of Jesus, it always makes us feel bad because I can never live up to it. And so don't, don't take it that way because he, he's going he's gonna to show us something that he's amazing and he does it perfectly and you and I can't do it. But his ministry starts after 30 years of him being on this planet. 30 years and he's doing nothing. In fact, the Bible, you get, you get very little. You get the Christmas story. Yay, he's born, miraculous, oh, that's really cool. But that's it, he's just a little baby, you know, and they almost tried to kill him, but oh, okay, baby. And then, and then you get this little time where, where Joe and Mary lose him. They can't find him. He's 12 years old, they can't find him, and they have to go look for him. And that's it for the next, you know, until he's 30 years old, get nothing. But here's the deal. He was God when he was born. He was God before he was born. He had all the God powers in him when he was 12. When he was 13, can you imagine his friends that broke their arm? And he could have just, okay, boom, done. Can you imagine when his village experienced that famine that came through and they, you know, people are starving, he could have went, oh, boom. He doesn't do any of it. I mean, come on, you got all this stuff. I mean, I'll order something from Amazon and, and I can't wait for it to get to you. You know, d- d- two days is too long. I'm, I'm like this two-hour thing. I will actually, you, you, ever, you know, if you've done this, I, I, I'll get and follow the truck. Oh, where's the, it's coming. It's six more stops. So, and then it goes right past my house. I'm going, hey, hey, me, I've been waiting. Right? And here Jesus is able to restrain and say, I will obey rather than sacrifice and do all these things that I know I can do. Because I want to wait until I'm obedient to the Father. He doesn't do a single miracle. And you may have read stories about Jesus taking clay and making little doves and then breathing life and they fly away and it's kind of cute. Or time when Mary wanted to give him a bath and he just kept parting the water. <laughs> Wouldn't get wet, you know. Those are, those are fairy tales. In, 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 John 2, in John 2, he says this. This miraculous sign at Cana of Galilee was the first time the first 30 years, all this power, all this ability, and he says, no, I will not sacrifice. I'll be obedient. I'm not going to do a single thing until I get released by the Father. And then he revealed his glory. Come on. So many of us sacrifice, and we call it for the Lord, especially if we're in ministry. Um, And we spend so much time doing things for God that we neglect those things that God wants us to pour into. Think about the 
proverbial pastor's kid or deacon's kid, right? They're always the ones that are messed up. Yeah, the pastor's kid. It's not always because we neglected them, but um, you see that, and I, and I watch it. It's not just pastor's kids, deacon kids. I watch it in some of your kids' lives. You are sacrificing so hard for your kids by providing them a home. You're working hard at your job. You're spending hours and hours there so you can kind of make something. You can get them the boat. You can get them the, 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 you know, the memberships and all, all the stuff. And they're just going, I, I was just kind of wanting dad. I was kind of wanting mom around. And the great lesson that Jesus teaches us here is it's better to obey than sacrifice. And God showed me over and over again on my time away and my sabbatical that it was better to obey. Obeying is way better than sacrifice. Uh, some people never get it. You know, there's a guy in the Bible who's the first king of Israel. His name was King Saul. And he's the first king of Israel, right? So he has the opportunity to really pave the way because the kings of Israel were, were set up by God to point the way to the king, the king of kings, the Messiah, Jesus himself, the final king of Israel is going to come, but say, hey guys, we're not it. I'm not, I'm not good enough to be it. I'm not going to do it perfectly, but I want to point to you. I want to show you a glimpse. I want to give you a little picture of what Jesus is going to be like when people, a whole nation follows God and lives under his authority. So I'm going to help you. I'll be an example for you. And Saul had this opportunity. Can you imagine you get to be the first guy? I, anybody who watched the Olympics? Uh, how cool would it be if you were the first person in your sport for your country? Nobody ever do it before. And you have this opportunity to be the first person to show the world what your nation can do in the sport, and you get Ray Gunn. <laughs> can you, can, do we have her? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I didn't look this up, but someone told me that she got zero points. And she did it three times, and she, I think the only one in the history of the Olympics to ever get zero, 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 yeah, three times. And, you know, Australia really ought to stick to swimming or something else, but uh, she had this chance to really show the world, hey, this is what Australia can do. King Saul, zero, zero, zero. He blew it. We can take her down now. Um, put up, it's better to obey than sacrifice. There you go. Uh, King Saul was, hey, you're the first king. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to follow me. I want you to obey me perfectly. I want you to show the people how to live. And we've got these Philistines that keep coming in and taking spoil. They're raping our kids. They're, they're, they're uh, uh, pillaging. They're doing awful things. And, and I want you, I'm going to raise you up and anoint you to go over there and kick butt, take names, stop that thing from going on. And when you do, here's what I want you to do, Saul. I don't want you to take any of the spoils of war. I want you to just get rid of all. I don't want th any of that stuff in my, in my kingdom at all. All right, so it's going to be a little bit different. All the other kings around, they take everything, slaves, and the whole thing. No, you, you just get rid of it all. So Saul goes, God's presence is upon him, and he kicks butt, takes names, wins the victory, and then he starts looking around. Oh, that's kind of cute. Oh, that's kind of nice. Oh, look at, oh. So he takes some of the spoils of war back with him. Now Samuel, who was the judge, the prophet at the time, comes and finds King Saul. Saul! How'd you do? Oh, man, just like you said, Samuel, God was with me. It was amazing. We kicked butt. We took names. Man, it's awesome. And, and he goes, did, did you do exactly what God said? Oh, yeah, we did exactly what God said. Did you get rid of all the spoils of war? Uh, yeah, we got rid of all the spoils of war. And then Samuel goes, well, when you went to war, I, I, I was there. I remember you guys took off. You didn't have any sheep with you. You didn't have any of this stuff with you. And, and what about that king over there? Oh, yeah, that's King Agag. He's, he's the leader. We're going to take him, and we're going to parade him for the people, and they're going to go, hey, look what we did. We got the king. You know, run him around on a leash. But that's not what God said. Oh, yeah, 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 but we got these sheep because we're going we're gonna to sacrifice them and give them as an offering to God, and it's going to be really cool. We, you know, we use, we'll throw this big party, and we'll offer them to God. It'll be great. Here's what Samuel says. Look on your notes in your Bible. It says, Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your offerings and sacrifices or obedience to his voice. Listen, and here's the line, and here's what <laughs> hit me right in the heart. Obedience is better than sacrifice. When we don't obey, it's called disobedience. Samuel thought that was too, too easy of a word for King Saul. So he uses another word. He calls it rebellion. The verse goes on. He says, rebellion 
not doing what God asks you to do, not doing what your parents ask you to do, not doing what your boss asks you to do, not doing what the law asks you to do, it's rebellion. We don't like that word. It's, oh, it's a little, no, nah, rebellion. And he says, rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. Stubbornness is the same thing as worshiping idols. And worshiping idols is whenever you put anything in front of God. God, I'd rather listen to my money than listen to you. I'll, I'll, I'll make a lot of money here if I do it this way, and so I'm kind of going after that. God, if I, if I hedge this on my job app, you know, I'll, I'll get this job. I know, I know you said, but I, if, I, if I do this, I'll win her heart. If I put on this mask, I'll win him. Anything that comes between you and God is an, is an idol. And what you're doing is you're simply rejecting God. You're saying, God, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not helping enough. Tell your wife sometime, I love my boat more than you. Because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you. You tell your wife that you love your boat more than her, she rejects you. And here's where it hit me. So many times in my work here at the church, I try to sacrifice for God to win his affection, to get him to like me. But in the end, I sense his rejection. I have this feeling of, I I'm not enough. I I'm just going to have to work harder. I, I failed. I've blown it too bad, so there's no way he doesn't reject me. But because you guys gave me that time away, I was able to stop intentionally get along with him. I heard him say this, I have not rejected you, and you don't have to win my affection. You see, Jesus perfectly obeyed so that he would be my perfect sacrifice. Jesus perfectly obeyed so he could be my perfect, so I don't have to sacrifice. I don't have to win his affection. I don't have to work harder to somehow be a good Christian. And Jesus showed us this. And how did he do it? How did he do it? I can't do it the way Jesus did, but maybe I can take some principles. And you're, you're, you're helping me get away and giving me that gift, gave me some, some pictures into this. At the very beginning of his ministry, remember before he ever did anything, Mark chapter one, he's just starting out. He's waited and he's obeying, obeying, obeying and not doing anything. And then the Holy Spirit says now, before he even does anything, the Bible says this, he went to a place where he could be alone so he could intentionally spend time with the Father. It says where he prayed, same thing. And Simon and his friends went to look for Jesus. Look what it says. When they found him, they called out, everyone is looking for you. You know, there are plenty of places for you and I to sacrifice for. You could, you could fill your car up with $100 bills and give them away every time you stop at a stoplight now, it seems like. Here's another one. Here's another one. And then you have to fill up again. There's plenty of places you can sacrifice. You could serve. Plenty of places. Everyone everyone's say, hey, come and volunteer for us. Hey, come and volunteer for us. Hey, come and volunteer for us. Plenty of places. Your neighbors always need your help. Everybody needs your help. Everyone is looking for And I had that feeling. Everyone is looking for Hey, I'm the pastor. I, I, I was so important in my own head. Everyone, everyone can't make it without me. And Jesus starts his ministry by getting alone and saying, Lord, Father, I don't want to do just because there's a need. I want to do because you have called me to it. He starts his ministry there, and then fast forward, chapter 14, end of the book. It says he went to the olive grove in Gethsemane. He said, I'm going to go over here and pray. I need to be alone with the Father again because I'm going to end my ministry. I start it with intentional time with the Father. All through there, you, you read stories of him getting alone, getting alone, getting alone. And then at the end, he says, man, I got to get alone because I'm getting ready to sacrifice. And he prayed those famous words. Not what I want to do, but what you want me to do, Father. And you and I can't do that. 
But you know what we can do? We can be a model. We can be a picture. We can be what King Saul wasn't. And we'll blow it and we'll make mistakes and we'll mess up, but we come back to the sacrifice of the, the Son of Christ who gave me the ability to get up and do it again. When we think everyone's looking for us, we think the place can't make it without us. The Father's saying, stop. Take some intentional time and listen and obey. When we started the church, we believed this. <clears throat> we didn't have a building. We didn't have people. We didn't have any money. We had a little money. That's not enough, right? It's never enough. And a couple people, never enough. So we would spend time praying intentionally as a team. God, open the doors. Help us. And you know what? God answered the prayers. He gave us a lot of money. He gave us a building. People started showing up. The very thing that we had prayed for became a distraction for me. Oh. Now I gotta pour into these people and I gotta make sure these buildings stuff. So I gotta get these budgets together. I gotta get this stuff together. Everyone's looking for me. Church board and the elders recognized it. Staff did too, about six months ago. And they said, Charlie, you need to get back and have some intentional time with God and really listen. Um, you need a sabbatical. And some of you are in the room, and I looked at you and I said, no, 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 I'm doing a great work here. I'm too important. No, no, the timing's wrong. Right? No, I, 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 there's, there's no, 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 no. And I couldn't get a single person to agree with me. <laughs> All in my own head. And God's saying, Charlie... You're going to obey or you're going to sacrifice? Because obedience is better. Let me close. Four things I learned. Now we'll get to this sermon, all right? Yes. Num number one. Number one. Didn't you miss me? Uh, <laughs> God wants to be your God. God wants to be. Who's the greatest coach of all time? Vince Lombardi, Bear Bryant, you know, John Wooden. <laughs> In your own mind. Uh, Who's that gal that, uh, that, uh, that uh, coached the uh, Tennessee Volunteers? The Pat something? You know. Yeah, but she was amazing. <laughs> let's, say, let's say you were the Chicago Bears, all right? Is that the worst team in the, in the league not right now? Yes, they are. Okay, the Chicago, <laughs> Chicago Bears, they're terrible, right? They're, they're, they don't got a lot of hope. But and all of a sudden, you know, uh, 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 you know, Vince Lombardi says, hey, guys, I want to be your coach. I mean, if you, you know, if you don't, don't know, Vince, Tom Brady, anybody heard of him? He's not a coach, but let's say he wanted to be their quarterback. Guy's in his prime. I'll, I'll be your quarterback. What? That, we're the worst team in the league, and we got Vince, the, we got Tom Br Wow, this is awesome. That's what God wants to do for you. He sees your team, and he says, man, you're not very good, but I want to be your coach. I want to be your God. I want to come in and, 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 and let, let's set this thing on a course that you never dreamed of. You can't do it by yourself, but you invite me into this thing. You let me be your, man, we will, we will win, the, we will win the, every, every award there ever was. We'll win the bowl, the whole thing. And so you go, okay, cool. This is awesome. Put out the news bulletin. And then he starts calling in the plays. I don't like that play. Let's not do that, guys. Brady's behind the guy. Guys, we're in the huddle. He's like, here's what we're going to do. And we run our own routes. No, I don't want to run that route. I don't want to run my own. Ah, oh, what does he know? We're gonna, I, 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 you know he, he thinks he knows because he's been really good at it, but I'm actually the guy having to run the play, so I'm going to actually do it the way I want to. So many of us have invited God into our life. We said yes to him. And we don't listen to his plays. Jeremiah says it like this. Uh, Obey me and I will be your God. And let me in the game. And you'll be my people. Can you imagine the God of the universe wants to direct our lives? Do everything I say that it may go well with you.
Charlie, you want it to go well? Or are you going to keep trying to carry this thing all by yourself? Number two, God is really talking with you. God is really talking with you. God never talks to me. I never hear his voice. I don't hear from God. I don't know what God's saying. I don't know. Ah, no, he talks only to important people. No. Well, I know many, many of us feel that way. Talk to other people. He won't talk to me. But that's not what the Bible says. I've got two little grandkids, <clears throat> Eating Grace and Baby Amos, and they are just the most adorable things in the whole world and just awesome. And they come over, and you know what I do? I get down on the ground, and I'm yakking with them. They don't understand. Eden Grace understands me. She's only nine months old, but she knows everything I'm saying. <clears throat> and I don't know everything she's saying. We have this thing going on. And, but I'm talking to them. Why? Love longs to communicate. Love longs to communicate. And we heard from Pastor Becky how much God loves us. And you need to hear that this morning. You may feel like, man, you're out there in left field, but Jesus sacrificed so that you didn't have to feel it in left field. And you could be close to him, and he loves you, and he wants to talk to you. John 8 says it like this. Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the word of God. Have you given your life to God? Have you gone through the waters of baptism and said, Jesus, I'm in, I'm all in? Then you belong to him. If you don't, look what he goes on to say. But if you don't listen because, but you don't listen because you, you don't belong to God. He's talking to the Pharisees there. Oh. He's talking, but Charlie, you're not listening. Wait a minute, I'm a pastor. I know, I know. But you can't hear his voice when you're running 90 to nothing doing your own thing. And he's talking and wants to speak to you. And if you don't hear him any place else, if you haven't heard this in four months, you're here today, but your first 14 minutes of your day will determine your destiny. Take the first 14 minutes of your day and say, okay, God, I, I, I can't hear this audible voice from you, but you know what? I can open up this book that you gave me that has your words in it, and I'll, I'll read it. I had someone uh, tell me today, man, they quote a scripture three times to me as they're directing their life, and I'm going, oh, man, he's got it, he's got it, he's got it. So give it a try. I promise you, you'll come back to me like this guy did and say, God speaks to me. God speaks to me because he wants to. Number three, uh, lonely places are life places. My wife says, yes, amen, to an uber extrovert like me. I went and, and spent almost a week alone with God. Now, I'm an uber extrovert. I, I, I'm never alone. In fact, the longest time I've spent alone before is like one, maybe two minutes. Um, <laughs> I, I get energy from people. But God said, why don't you come alone with me? And I went to this place, a family in our church owns a cabin uh, up in the mountains and there's no electricity. They got solar panels and some batteries. There's no running water. They, you know, they kind of drain from a hose up to this thing. And, and if you stand in the right spot, you got to get there four wheel drive. You stand in the right spot, you might get cell service. And it's me and the chipmunks and nothing. Mosquitoes, yes. But you know what? God met me there. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm going to try to do it once a month, not for a week, but a couple days. Because, what, what's it say? Uh, uh, but when you pray, uh, go by yourself. Shut the door behind you. Pray to your Father in private. I encourage you, man. Don't try to just do your prayer on your commute to work, man, and traffic and the whole thing. And, oh, Jesus, help me. I, I get it. I pray on your commute, but find a place. Get alone. Shut the door. If you're, a, if you're a mom of a preschooler, that's tough. That's the Santa used to try to get alone. She'd go into the bathroom. The kids are sending notes under the door. <laughs> mom. But he says, then your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Reward you. I, this is pretty cool, but I came back down and I took the key to the family. I said, man, thank you. It was the greatest thing in my life. He goes, Pastor. I want you to keep the key. You can use it anytime. Like, wow. So that's why I'm going to try to take a couple days every month and go up there and just be alone. All right, let me, let me close. Uh, listen to me, Linda. 34 million people have seen this in the last 10 years. And if you have it, you're in for a treat. Watch this. Like, I mean, listen to me, listen to me. Like, like, I do this all the time. And if I go out at the, at the house, or the door, 
Matt has his toy, and then Matt has all his toys. Okay. But I have to yell at you guys. Okay, Linda, Linda, listen, Be listen, 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 you listen, listen, Linda, listen. Okay, what? Like everything they do at this house, they can't trust everything at Grandma's house. You could do it at Grandma's house. Okay. <laughs> okay, then what? Then you're not listening to me. Then you're not listening to me. I asked you not to do something. Linda, but listen to me. Look at if we do something, if you get that out, that bird thing off. You're gonna break it. Okay, but I'm asking, I'm letting you know but that you cannot. No, Linda, Linda, I'm. Li lick it, lick it. You're not listening to me. Linda, listen to me now. Lick it, lick listen it. to me listen now. To, listen to me. No, you're not listening. I said no cupcakes, and you try to get cupcakes and you try to ask Grandma. Linda, Didn't you? Linda, lick it, lick it, lick it. If we do something right out, this is the. If you get close up, you can't even get them. You're going to burn your butt. <laughs> What's going to burn your butt? No. You and Kevin don't listen. So I have to give both of you guys pop pals in your butt. But Linda, but Grandpa's going to give me pop pals in your butt. No, he's not. Yeah. I have to. You want? You don't want me to hit Kevin or you don't want him to spank you? No. Why? Because anybody oh. wants to spank me. And then I have to spank Kevin. But he's, the, but he's my little pop pop. He's your little pop-ups, but he doesn't listen. But Linda, honey, honey, okay. look at, look at this. All right, let's stop. I, <laughs> I don't know which one is God in that story, whether it's Linda or the little kid, but <laughs> sometimes I feel like I'm telling God what for, and he's just, just listen to me, and sometimes <laughs> Psalm 85 says, I listen carefully to God to what God the Lord is saying, for he speaks peace to his faithful people. You and I will never listen perfectly, but we can listen carefully. We'll never follow perfectly. Adam and Eve couldn't do it. You and I can't do it. But I learned in my time away that I can stop living in fear of the pow-pow on my burn my butt. <laughs> and that I'm never going to get anything good from God. I recognize that the one who obeyed perfectly sacrificed for me perfectly. And I'm learning that I want God to be my God. And maybe it's not going well for you in your marriage, your, your finances, your job, your kids, whatever. And maybe today's the day you let God in the game. I know I'm a Christian, but I'll actually let you call the plays. Um, and God really is talking to you. And that maybe there's a, a Linda, a Jesus, you need to stop arguing with and say, okay, okay, I'll wait on the cupcakes. Can we stand together? We're going to sing this last song. While we're singing, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward, our staff and our elders and our board members just to come and line across the front here and We've started this since I've been gone. That's you, April. Come on up. Bring your husband with you. He's a good prayer person. And um, as we sing, maybe, maybe you're going, you know, I, I need prayer. I'm going to take this moment. I'm going to come up and have one of these people of faith pray with me over my challenge, my frustrations, my fears. Let God do something in your life that maybe has been a long time for you. I know it has been for me. And Again, I want to say thank you. Thank you for welcoming me back. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to learn some things that hopefully we can grow together in the next years that God has for us. Rach, you ready? Okay.
Father, I thank you, God, for your people. I thank you, God, that you're a God who loves us and cares. And God wants something greater for us than God, we've exp- what we've experienced. And the fears and, God, the, the, the worry that we carry, the burdens that we just kind of always fighting through. God, I want to invite you in today. I want to invite you into my life. I want to invite you in to call the shots. I want to invite you in to be my God. And God, I want to listen to you. God, stop the argument in my head. That I would say, yes, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You're welcome in my life. Lead me and guide me. I give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen.